The world of Fallout is a desolate place in which the structures and civilizations of the old world have long since been blasted into oblivion. Before the Great War of 2077, the average citizen may have spent their days slaving away in the aisles of a super duper mart, or in their desk job at Nuka-Cola corporate offices, looking to make enough money to afford their own little slice of the American dream, but in the wasteland, that dream has become a nightmare and instead of working to afford a life of comfort, cola, and the latest Mr. Handy model, citizens of the wasteland scrape, fight, and struggle for bottles of dirty water, a safe place to spend the night, or a box of 200-year-old Blamco mac and cheese. But there are a few enterprising individuals who have risen up to make a name and fortune for themselves in this irradiated hellscape. Individuals who through grit and determination, or just a bit of luck, have become what most would deem as wealthy. But in a world of chaos, how do we even begin to define wealth? Sure, you've got caps, the closest thing to a legitimate currency across the entire wasteland, backed by the precious commodity of traders' water supplies. Or if you're in the New California Republic, maybe you're dealing with NCR dollars, tied to the NCR's gold reserves. But when the government backing that currency crumbles, or if you find yourself among isolated folks who couldn't care less about your discarded bottle caps, those currencies don't really mean much. So maybe it's time to rethink what makes someone wealthy in the wasteland. Instead of counting caps or NCR dollars, perhaps true wealth lies in resources. The wealthiest individuals might be those with the means to gather and trade resources, things that people will always need, no matter the currency of the region, be it caps, ring pulls, or even punga fruit. Whether it's food, clean water, entertainment, chems, or even the promise of safety, these are the commodities that can make or break fortunes in the post-apocalypse. Take Alistair Tenpenny for example. This man travelled all the way from the UK to the capital wasteland, determined to make his fortune. In his early years stateside, he managed to amass a modest amount of wealth, just enough to hire mercenaries to fetch valuable items and trinkets for him. But Tenpenny's true crowning achievement came when he found himself in the right place at the right time. Alongside his accomplice, Mr. Burke, he cleared out a derelict resort southwest of DC, and transformed it into the luxurious Tenpenny Tower a sanctuary in the waste for those with the caps to afford it. Behind the mighty security gates of Tenpenny Tower, residents are treated to luxuries unheard of in the wasteland, all while enjoying the safety provided by Tenpenny's crack security team. And for this secure, opulent lifestyle, residents like the wealthy communist Irvin Cheng, the purveyor of fine fashion Anthony Ling, and the famed adventurer Herbert Daring Dashwood, all pay Tenpenny a hefty rent. This income was more than enough to keep trade caravans rolling in, ensuring that both Tenpenny Tower and Tenpenny's personal penthouse remained well stocked with luxury goods, and it also allowed him to regularly and reliably pay his security team, something of a rarity for most mercenary groups in the wasteland. Now John Caleb Bradburton is an unusual case on this list. As the founder of the Nuka-Cola Corporation and a skilled chemist, Bradburton was one of the wealthiest individuals in the pre-war world. His fortune was so vast that it was said he owned half of Massachusetts, and held considerable sway over the United States government. Remarkably, Bradburton even managed to keep himself alive for hundreds of years after the Great War, making him perhaps the wealthiest pre-war individual still active in the wasteland. However, despite his immense wealth, insider knowledge of government secrets, and the vast resources of the Nuka-Cola company, Bradburton couldn't truly benefit from any of it in the wasteland. His participation in the Leap X government program, which was designed to extend his life indefinitely, resulted in a cruel twist of fate. Bradburton was reduced to nothing more than a disembodied head in a jar, trapped beneath his own Nuka World theme park. With no one aware of his presence and no way to access his vast resources, Bradburton was stripped of his wealth and left utterly powerless. Next on our list is someone not too dissimilar to Bradburton, and probably the first to come to mind when thinking of wealthy individuals in Fallout, Mr. House. 
As a pre-war industrialist and owner of H&H &H Tool Company, Robco Industries, and Repcon Aerospace, Robert House was one of the wealthiest individuals in the pre-war world. But unlike Bradburton, House managed to maintain a portion of his wealth and resources after the Great War. When the bombs fell, House took extraordinary personal measures to protect his burgeoning empire around Las Vegas from destruction, but in doing so he fell unconscious for decades. When he finally emerged, the world, and his beloved Vegas, had drastically changed, ransacked by the survivors of the wasteland. Undeterred, House revealed himself to the remnants of Vegas, and used his ruthless skills in persuasion and boardroom backstabbing to build a new empire from the ruins. He struck a deal with the local raider tribes, in exchange for helping him retake and rebuild the Strip. Each tribe would be granted their own casino to run, with House reigning over them as the CEO of the Free Economic Zone of New Vegas. The area flourished, becoming an oasis of decadence and luxury amidst the wasteland, all under the watchful protection of House's army of Securitrons. But House didn't just offer security and comfort like Alistair Tenpenny did, he also provided something rare in the wasteland, entertainment. And it was a powerful money-making machine. The constant flow of tourists from the New California Republic funneled a steady stream of wealth, whether in caps or NCR dollars, straight into House's pockets. In fact, by 2280, House's wealth was so vast that he had no trouble paying out 812,545 caps to scavenging teams to search for the Platinum Chip, a sum equivalent to 162,509 Salisbury Stakes. And speaking of stakes, that brings us to our personal pick for the wealthiest individual in the wastes, Heck Gunderson. Now, Heck started out as a small-time rancher in the New California Territory, but through sheer ruthlessness, he expanded his holdings across California and Nevada, eventually becoming one of the largest individual landowners in the wasteland. On those vast stretches of land, Heck cultivated one of the most vital resources of all, food. He established a near monopoly on Brahmin and Bighorner farming in the region. Unlike Mr. House, who provides entertainment only to the few fortunate enough to visit the Strip, Heck feeds the masses. And that Brahmin empire made him so wealthy that he could afford to hire his own army of mercenaries. An army he used to strong arm small ranches into selling their land, sabotage his rival supplies, and tighten his grip on the beef industry. This monopoly allowed Heck to drive rival farms out of business, bribe and control the NCR, and in a surprisingly altruistic move, attempt to lower the price of meat to make it more affordable for everyone. When his son went missing at the Ultralux Casino, there were whispers among the Strip's residents that if Heck did not get what he wanted, he'd be more than capable of raising the casino to the ground, and taking out Mr. House and the rest of the Strip along with it. So that's why we believe no other single individual holds such sway, such power, or the ability to generate wealth, as Heck Gunderson in the entirety of the Wasteland. What do you think? Did we leave anyone off the list? How would you build your own fortune in the Wasteland? Let us know down in the comments and make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on our next adventure. Thanks for joining us, catch you next time.